All right, today we're going to move into part two of Kant's groundwork of the metaphysic of morals, which sometimes gets translated fundamental principles of the metaphysic of morals, because as we saw last time, Kant's project in this relatively short work is to discover the supreme principle of morality. Doing so is what he means by establishing the groundwork of a metaphysic of morals. Remember that by metaphysics, Kant means the application of a universal and necessary principle, like every event has a cause, to a determinate object of my perception. So if I throw a ball against the wall and it bounces back to me, I can explain that particular event in space and time in terms of the universal and necessary principle that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Okay? So that would be an exercise or a judgment in the metaphysic of nature, or what Kant calls physics. Simple enough. But just as there are universal necessary principles which govern the behavior of objects in space and time, if ethics is to be something real, if there are actual ethical principles, or at least one, which is actually incumbent on all rational beings, then I must discover what that supreme principle of morality is so that I may apply it to particular situations. Such that, for example, if you tell me a lie and I say that you ought not to have done so, my basis for saying so would be the universal necessary principle that Kant calls the categorical imperative. Okay? And we got a little bit of practice last time in applying the categorical imperative to a particular situation. If you tell me a lie and I say you shouldn't have done that, you say, why not? I say, well, why did you tell me the lie? What was your maxim? And you said, well, my maxim was I was in an uncomfortable situation and telling a lie extricated me from it. So I ask you, do you think you can raise that subjective explanation or principle, which Kant calls a maxim, a subjective principle of volition, to the level of a universal law? And if you thought about it, you would realize that if everybody always told lies when it was convenient for them to do so, no one would ever believe anyone, and it would be impossible to lie. And so if your maxim contradicts itself when rendered as a universal principle, the action is prohibited. Okay? So far, so good. So Kant's task in this book is to discover the supreme principle of morality, which of course he calls the categorical imperative. And we saw that by an imperative we mean a command. Do this, or do not do that. But to say that imperatives of morality are categorical means that they apply universally and with absolute necessity to all rational beings. You do not need to have an interest in the end in order to be subject to the imperative of morality. Unlike the situation in which I say, if you don't want to get rained on this afternoon, then you ought to carry an umbrella. But if you don't care about getting wet in the rain, then that imperative doesn't apply to you. 
Okay? And most of our imperatives are hypothetical like that. You know, if you want X, then you ought to do Y. But if I'm not interested in X, then I have no interest in Y. But when it comes to issuing moral imperatives, they must be categorical. Otherwise, the ethical relativist is correct, and there simply is no objective truth or standard in morality. Okay. Now, of course, we saw that inasmuch as metaphysics for Kant signifies the application of a universal necessary principle to a determinate situation, a specific situation or event. We can do both a metaphysic of nature, which we call physics, or a metaphysic of morals, which we call ethics. Okay? And if we are going to do a metaphysic of freedom, that is, apply universal necessary moral principles to our freedom in order to determine what I ought or ought not to do, first I need to lay the groundwork for that metaphysic of morals. And the groundwork entails discovering what the supreme principle is. And Kant calls it the categorical imperative. So we saw last time that the categorical imperative, while a supreme singular principle, does have three different formulations or articulations, each of which will emphasize a different aspect of the moral requirements of a rational being. The first formulation we saw can be stated roughly as one ought act only upon that maxim which can be made into a universal law. So when I consider whether or not some action is permissible or impermissible, I ask myself, what if everyone did this all the time? Would it still be possible for me to achieve my original object? And if not, then the action is prohibited. And we call that the formula of universality. Okay? Now, do you remember, Kant tells us that if the supreme principle of morality is to be actually binding on all rational beings, then it must be pure and discovered purely a priori. Because I could never discover a universal necessary principle simply by looking at my particular contingent perception. If I throw the ball at the wall and it bounces back to me once, that one perception could never tell me that it would happen that way necessarily and universally. So the discovery of the supreme principle of morality, the moral law, the categorical imperative, is to deliver a real moral imperative, we must discover it on the basis of reasoning alone, a priori, without any admixture of something empirical or perceptual. Okay? Now part of the beauty of Kant's theory is that the categorical imperative act only on that maxim which you can will as a universal law, does not contain any content. It doesn't say that if you want something which you cannot afford, you ought not to steal it, 
It doesn't say that if you make a promise, you ought to keep it. It simply says, only act on that maxim which can be willed as a universal law. And so the categorical imperative contains only the form of action, but not the content. Now, where did the form of this imperative come from? Well, for Kant, to be a rational being simply means having the ability to formulate universal principles. Okay? For example, if I feed my dog, certainly it knows that if it's hungry, it can go eat that food, okay? But it does not think about the food as fitting into the class of objects called nutrition, okay? Animals, other than rational animals or rational beings, do not universalize. Okay. So let's take a look at what it means to render or formulate a universal principle. Okay. When I say that every event must have a cause, I am asserting that I know this to be the case even before I experience some event in the future. I know that in the future, should I experience some event, that it will necessarily have a cause, whether or not I'm able to determine what that particular cause was. So the categorical imperative contains only the form of universality in general. Okay? You understand what I mean by that? It doesn't contain any content. It just contains the form of universalization. So all Kant is doing here is saying that when determining what I ought or ought not to do, I must ask whether my personal maxim could serve as a universal principle. Kant is simply co insisting on consistency. If everyone could abide by the same principle without contradiction, then the action is permitted. But if universalizing my maxim engenders a contradiction or makes it impossible for me to achieve my original goal, then the action is prohibited. Okay? This much you should be at least somewhat comfortable with. Now look, when it comes to the behavior of natural objects, things in space and time, like desks and the earth, and even my own body, okay? These things are perfectly determined in their behavior by nature. If I throw a rock up into the air, it doesn't have a choice but to come back down, okay? So things are perfectly determined by the laws of nature. We, on the other hand, as rational beings, which from the practical side of things means free beings, do have a choice when it comes to abiding by the categorical imperative or not. And so Kant says that because the supreme principle of morality does not infallibly determine my will. In other words, 
because I, as a free being, do not follow the categorical imperative with absolute perfection, like rocks follow the laws of physics with absolute perfection, my will must be necessitated. Necessitation means the determination of the will by the objective principle of morality, the categorical imperative. So, let's say, remember, that as Kant puts it, my will is sort of situated between two incentives. Think about the old image of somebody with an angel on one shoulder and a devil on another shoulder, right? And they're they're whispering in his ears and trying to sway him to do the right or the wrong thing, okay? Well, Kant says that my will is sort of like that. On the one shoulder, I have some material incentive that I hope to achieve, like getting you to lend me some money, which I know I'm not going to pay back, okay? Or telling you a lie because I don't want to get in trouble. But on the other side, or shoulder, is not a material incentive, but the pure, formal principle of morality, the categorical <coughs> imperative. Now notice, my material incentive, which is a posteriori, or what Kant calls a material incentive, like even something good, let's say giving to charity. If I have an inclination to give to charity, it makes me feel good, okay? Even though giving to charity is what duty would prescribe, if I am doing it not because of duty, but because I have an inclination to do it, okay? I have an ulterior motive to do it, like a tax write-off or something. Even though I'm doing the very action that duty prescribes, my will lacks moral content, and the will cannot be called good. The will can only be called good when it is determined by the pure formal principle of the categorical imperative. So are you with me there? This is about your maxim. Remember, the second proposition from part one. Actions from duty get their moral worth not from the purpose to be attained, but from the maxim by which they are determined. Okay? It's the reason you do it, not what you do, that determines whether the will is good or not. Okay? Yes? So, um, what kind of action would be like a priori? It is not that an action is a priori, but the maxim that could be a priori. Remember, I know before I ever find myself in a situation where I'm considering stealing or lying or giving a charity or whatever, I know in advance that the moral thing to do will require my ability to universalize the maxim upon which I am acting, okay? So if I give to charity, it isn't the giving to charity that is a priori, of course. What would possibly be a priori is the principle upon which I am acting. And the categorical imperative is an a priori principle because all I need to do is think about what would happen if universally no one gave to charity. Okay? However, if I do give to charity, not because duty requires it of me, but simply because I want a good reputation or people to like me or to get a tax write-off, then the maxim is not a priori, 
It is a posteriori. It is based on a material incentive rather than a formal principle. Okay? With me? All right. Now, given the categorical imperative, rational beings have duties. Okay? And we saw that duty is simply the necessity of acting out of respect for the moral law, the categorical imperative. But not all duties are the same, or of the same type. In fact, Kant draws a distinction between two types of duty. There are what he calls perfect duties, and I'm just going to draw a little chart here for you. Okay. There are duties that are perfect, and there are duties that are imperfect. And some perfect duties are duties which I have to myself, while others are duties that I bear to others. Likewise, there are imperfect duties duties which I bear to myself, while other imperfect duties I bear toward others. <clears throat> so let's give some examples of perfect and imperfect duties to self and to others. But before we do that, you need to understand what makes a duty either perfect or imperfect. Okay. Now, if I say to you, you have asked me a question, but if I tell you the truth, I'm going to get into trouble. So I ask myself, being a good person, even though I fear trouble, just as everyone does, I ask myself whether it is morally permissible for me to tell you a lie. So my personal maxim would be, in order to extricate myself from an uncomfortable situation, I am going to tell a lie. But if I try to raise that subjective principle to an objective universal principle, that would mean that everybody lied all the time with the same regularity of the laws of physics. And I immediately realized that if everybody always lied, lying would be impossible. And therefore, I can't even achieve my original goal of lying successfully. Okay? So the maxim contradicts itself at the universal level. When your attempt to universalize your maxim contradicts itself, we are dealing with a perfect duty, and thus I have a perfect duty not to lie. All right? And the same thing would be true of stealing. If I say, you possess an object which I would like to possess. You will not give it to me. You will not sell it to me. And so I ask myself, am I morally permitted to steal it from you? But if I attempt to raise that subjective principle, the maxim, to the universal level, such that everybody stole everything which they desired, I would realize that the entire institution of personal property would become meaningless. I wouldn't be able to keep the very thing that I stole. I stole it for the sake of possessing it. But if everyone steals everything, there are no possessions. So again, the maxim contradicts itself. And I have a perfect duty not to steal. Okay? Now the example that Kant uses as a perfect duty to myself is that 
I cannot commit suicide. And here's how he arrives at this conclusion. If my maxim is something like this, I'm suffering from, let's say, a terminal illness. I'm in constant pain. And my life affords me no further opportunity for any joy or relief. And because I love myself and don't want to suffer, I elect to commit suicide. So my maxim is out of self-love and my desire no longer to suffer, I am going to take my own life. But if I were to raise that maxim to a universal level, then I would be using the same principle, self-love, which promotes life in order to justify ending life. It's only out of what Kant is calling self-love, like my instinct to preserve my own life, okay? that perpetuates life and propagates it. But I cannot use the very same principle, in this case, the principle of self-love, as the basis both for the preservation of life and the destruction of life. That is a contradiction. And if everybody use the principle of self-love as justification for suicide, then it would be impossible to commit suicide because there would be nobody alive to kill themselves. Okay? So I have a perfect duty not to kill myself. And we've already seen a number of examples of perfect duties to others. For example, I cannot make false promises. I realize that even though if I falsely promise to pay you back five dollars, should you lend it to me today, if everybody lied in order to get what they want, no one would ever believe anybody and therefore borrowing would become impossible. So again, at the universal level, the maxim of a false promise is self-contradictory, and thus I have a perfect duty not to make a lying promise. Okay? However, there are other duties which do not directly lead to a contradiction at the universal level. For example, every one of us is in possession of some kind of talent, okay? Whether it's caring for other people, or being patient, or teaching, or, or a particular sport, or art form, or whatever it is, cooking, sewing, okay? And let's say that my parents tell me from a, an early age that you have an aptitude for this and I think you should develop it because this could be the basis for a nice life for you, okay? But I say to myself, you know what? I know I'm pretty good at this sport, but I'd rather just sit on the couch and play Xbox all day, okay? So being the sophisticated child I am, I ask myself, do I have a moral duty to develop this talent? And I make it my personal maxim that because I would rather spend my time in leisure rather than practicing my art, I am not going to develop my talent. Now, if I raise that maxim to the level of universality, even though the world might be very different because nobody ever developed their talents, 
I could still get away with not developing my own talent. The world would go on. There's no direct contradiction. However, think about this. If I say I don't want to develop my talent because I would rather sit on a couch and play my Xbox all afternoon, guess what? If no one ever developed their talents, not only would I not have an Xbox, I wouldn't have a couch. I wouldn't have a house. My life would be very different. So even though the maxim doesn't contradict itself, it does contradict my will for myself. I would never will to live in a world where no one ever developed their talents. We'd have no cell phones, no televisions. We'd have no, no supermarkets, light bulbs. pencils, light bulbs. We'd have to harvest all our own food. We'd have to do everything for ourselves. We'd be in Hobbes' state of nature. Okay? And so I realized I cannot consistently will that universally nobody develops their talents because it contradicts what I want for myself. Okay? So I do have a duty to develop my talent, although it is an imperfect duty. Okay? Talent development. What about an imperfect duty to others? Well, what about giving to charity? Let's say that I have some sense that maybe I should give to charity if I have some expendable income, but I really don't want to, okay? So I say, because I would rather not give to charity, I need to ask myself, what if nobody was ever charitable? Is there a contradiction? And again, according to Kant, there is not. The world would go on. Okay? I could easily not be charitable in a world where nobody was charitable. But because I know that on countless occasions I have benefited from the charitable nature of others, and I'm not just talking about somebody giving me money, but even helping me to pick up my books when I drop them. Or if I get injured, helping me up, helping me to clean out my wound, whatever. These are all charitable acts. And because I know that I will, again, benefit from the charitable nature of others, even though there's no direct contradiction in universalizing the principle of non-charitableness. Just as in the case of developing my talent, it does contradict what I will for myself, because I want to live in a world where people are charitable. Thus, I have an imperfect duty to others to be charitable. Now, why does Kant take the time to distinguish perfect from imperfect duties. The point is this. I can easily imagine a situation in which a perfect duty conflicts with an imperfect duty. Okay, imagine this. Imagine that I borrowed 10 bucks from you yesterday and I promised to pay you back today. But as I'm driving to school, I see someone on the side of the road, let's say I see a woman with, you know, a young child, and she asks me if I have any money. Now ordinarily, I realize I do have an imperfect duty to be charitable if I can afford to do so. But because I have already made you a promise to pay back that $10 today, the perfect duty of keeping promises outranks the imperfect duty of being charitable. Now you may be wondering what if two perfect duties conflict? And according to Kant, that cannot happen. Now I personally can imagine situations in which this might happen, like let's say that again Remember I was talking about the Dutch fishermen who had smuggled the Jewish families out of Germany during the Nazi occupation. Let's say that I have made a promise 
to this family to do everything within my power to transport them to safe shores. But as we are sailing, I get boarded by the SS, and they ask me a direct question. Do you have anyone on board? I know I have a perfect duty to tell the truth, but I also have a perfect duty to keep my promises. Okay? Well, remember that I can have a perfect or imperfect duty either to myself or to others. Okay? So if I tell the truth, then I've broken my promise to the family. If I tell a lie, even though I've kept my promise to the family, I have violated my duty of truth telling. Okay? So in some way, Kant is going to have to find a way out of this. For example, since I've already made the promise, perhaps I simply don't answer. Okay? Now remember, while that's a good insight, this is a non-consequentialist theory. So it doesn't matter if somebody gets hurt. What matters is that I can universalize my maxim. Okay? All right. Now, we have said that there is really a categorical imperative. And the first formulation states that I ought to mac I ought to act only on that maxim which can be willed as a universal law. And we further saw that this imperative is discovered purely a priori, because all I'm doing is taking the form of rationality, which is universalizing, and applying it to my own behavior. If I can universalize my maxim, then the action's permitted. If I can't, it's prohibited. The categorical imperative is categorical, i.e. universal and necessary, because it is pure and discovered a priori. It contains only the form of action, not the content. So I know in advance of any particular situation exactly what is required of me. I must be able to either universalize my maxim, okay, such that it doesn't contradict itself, or universalize it such that it doesn't contradict what I will for myself, as in the case of an imperfect duty. But the question becomes, how do I know that such an imperative actually exists? Exactly. It must be grounded in something. Again, the question is, what is the origin of this imperative? Notice, if all imperatives were hypothetical, then there would be no need for a universal ground, because all I need is to have an interest in some material incentive in order for it to make sense for me to follow the hypothetical imperative. If I want ice cream, then I should go to the ice cream store, okay? And of course, I know whether I want an ice cream cone or not, just by attending to my own desires. But how do I know that a categorical imperative actually exists? If there is an imperative of morality, which is categorical, meaning universal and necessary, applying to all rational beings, then it must be grounded 
not in something subjective or individualistic, it must be grounded in something which itself possesses absolute worth. And for Kant, there is such a thing. Rational nature itself. Rational beings, us, persons, are ends in ourselves. Remember when we talked about Aristotle, and Aristotle said that happiness is a rational end because we value it intrinsically, okay? It has intrinsic value. Kant is saying that rational beings also have intrinsic value. We are ends in ourselves in the same way that happiness is an end in itself. Why? Because we are free. Because as a rational being, which means having the ability to formulate a universal principle and the ability to act according to a principle rather than just according to my inclinations, that gives me a worth which is absolutely inviolable. I have an absolute worth. Think about it like this. If my dog is hungry, it is going to eat. And the only reason it might not eat is if I have conditioned it not to eat until I give it a command. It behaves entirely on the basis of conditioning and instinct. Okay? It does not consider principles. Dogs don't go on hunger strikes. Okay? They don't fast for Ramadan or for, you know, for blood tests. They don't act on principle. But this ability to formulate a principle and act according to it, rather than simply doing whatever I feel like doing, gives me what Kant calls a dignity. Rational beings possess dignity. And that really means nothing other than being autonomous or free. Okay? Autonomy means freedom. The word auto means self. So autonomy means being self-directed. Other animals, like my cat, is not a self-directed being. Okay? It does whatever its instinct prompts it to do. But it will not stage a protest based on principle. Okay? Because it's not capable of formulating universal principles. Our rational ability to act according to a principle rather than according to our inclinations, our feelings, gives us a worth that is beyond anything else. Things like desks and computers and pencils have a price. They have a market value and their value is determined by our desire for them. Simple supply and demand economics. The more people that desire a particular product, the higher the price goes. When interest in a product declines, the price goes down. Okay? But we are the ones that set those market values. And we do so according to what we freely decide to intend or to pursue. As a free being, that is, an autonomous being, you and I have a dignity, a worth which cannot be violated or degraded even by anything I do. 
I could be the worst person in the world, okay? I could harm people, steal things, lie all the time. But so long as I am a free being, I still possess and retain the worth of a rational being. And that worth commands respect. So I don't need to like you. I don't need to know you. I do not need to benefit from you, but I must respect you simply because you are a free being. And so when Kant asks whether a categorical imperative actually exists, the question is, is there something which exists that itself has absolute worth? And the answer is yes, rational beings. So the absolute authority of the categorical imperative is grounded in the absolute worth of rational beings themselves. Okay? If there were no beings that possessed absolute worth, but rather all value was relative, okay, then all imperatives would be hypothetical. There wouldn't be a supreme categorical principle of morality. The categorical imperative exists only because we exist as its absolute ground. Okay? People have unconditional value. Things, only conditional value. And so Kant then arrives at the second formulation of the categorical imperative. And this one says, act, or excuse me, I should say, act in such a way that you always treat humanity whether it is the humanity in yourself or the humanity in that of another. Never simply as a means, but always as an end in itself. Or to simplify it, treat all rational beings as ends in themselves and never only as a means. Now, we've talked about the relationship between means and ends before, okay? When we were discussing the Pauline principle, we said the end doesn't justify the means, right? Well, Kant agrees wholeheartedly. If treating you as less than a dignified being were to bring about a cornucopia of blessings, it still wouldn't matter because you have an absolute worth that outranks anything that I might achieve by violating that worth. Okay? So I must treat you and any rational being not just necessarily human beings, because we may at some point discover other rational beings. Alien life. Maybe we come to discover that dolphins are actually rational in Kant's sense of rationality. I must treat rational beings as ends in themselves, and never only as a means. So you tell me, what do you suppose it means to say, don't use people as a means? or don't treat people as a means only. How could I treat you as a means to my own end? Like using someone? Yes! <clears throat> don't use people. Because people aren't things. They aren't tools. Things and tools have only conditional value. If I don't have a nail to drive into the wall, I have no use or, va or, or desire for the hammer. But I don't need to have a use for you 
I still am required to treat you with the respect commanded by rational nature itself, autonomy. Okay? Now, of course, we enter into agreements all the time. So if I say, if you paint my house, I'll pay you $5,000, I'm not using you as a means only because you are benefiting from the very same action that I am benefiting from. Okay, my house is getting painted and you are getting paid. Okay, so we are both being treated as an end. But if I deceive you, if I lie to you, if I steal from you, I have failed to respect your autonomy. Because think about it, if I tell you a lie, then you are no longer free to make an informed decision about your own behavior. I have done something that impedes your freedom, and I cannot do that. Okay? Now, we've been using this term autonomy. And autonomy, again, means being self-directed. Well, the counter term is heteronomy. Now, if autonomy means being self-directed, what do you suppose Heteronomy means. Well, look, if my autonomy means that I direct my own behavior, yes, that's the point. Others. Auto means self. Hetero means other, right? Like as in heterosexual, the other sex, okay? So even though we as rational beings are always free, meaning we, we direct our own behavior, we are autonomous, it is still possible for me to act in a way that is heteronymous, or does not do justice to the autonomous nature of my will. If I allow my behavior to be determined not by the objective principle of morality, but rather by some material incentive toward which I have an inclination, and remember, duty and inclination are always the competing motivations, then my will has behaved heteronymously because I have allowed my behavior to be determined by something other than my own rationality. If there is a cake and I have a passion, a desire to eat the entire cake, and I do so, then I have allowed that cake to master me. It has such power over my passions that I couldn't control my own behavior and I ate the whole thing. So I've acted heteronymously. The cake has controlled my behavior rather than my reason. But if my reason guides my behavior as the result of attempting to universalize my maxim or by asking whether I am treating rational beings as ends in themselves, then my will is autonomous. Okay? Yes? So an example of heteronomy would be like group thing? Sure, absolutely. If I'm not thinking for myself, but I'm letting other people motivate my behavior, then I am acting more like a thing or an animal than like a person. Why? Because look, when I throw the chalk up in the air as a natural thing, it does not make the decision to come back down. Its behavior is determined by something outside of itself. 
something other, the laws of gravitation. We, on the other hand, are self-directed. I can act not just according to my inclinations, but according to the pure rational principle, the categorical imperative. And when I do so, my will is autonomous. Okay? So, for Kant, if my behavior is determined not by the pure rational principle, the categorical imperative, but rather I allow my behavior to be determined simply by my inclinations, my feelings, my passions, my desires, then I am acting more like a thing or an animal than like a person because I'm allowing my behavior to be determined by something outside of myself. Okay? And so we arrive at yet the third formulation of the categorical imperative, which states that I should act so that my will can regard itself as giving universal law through its maxim, or alternatively, treat all rational beings as law-giving members of a kingdom of ends. All right. So this third formulation is called the formulation of the kingdom of ends. What on earth does that mean? Well, first of all, by a kingdom, Kant means a systematic unity of beings under common law, okay, or common laws. So, for example, nature, the planets, physical objects, are a kingdom of things because they are all governed by the common laws of nature, okay? And because, let's just think about our own solar system, all the planets follow the same laws of nature. They follow their orbits according to the, their gravitational attractions to one another and to other cosmological bodies harmoniously. They don't bump into each other, okay? But imagine that one day one of the planets becomes self-aware and says, I'm tired of being pushed around by these laws of physics, and I'm going to stop orbiting the sun. Well, then the earth but smashes into it, and there's chaos, discord, disharmony, okay? Well, we are not members of a kingdom of nature. We are members of a kingdom of ends, because every single one of us is an end in ourself. We are each a king in this kingdom of ends. We are subject only to the law of our own making because we are the categorical imperative. The categorical imperative is simply the articulation of the form of rationality itself, which is universality. So if you ask, what is the origin, what is the ground of the categorical imperative? It's us. It's our freedom. So the third formulation is basically just saying, when I'm deciding what to do, I need to ask whether my action is going to give proper reverence to all other rational beings such as they deserve, as kings, autonomous, self-directed beings. But, on the other hand, if my action impedes your freedom, then I have introduced discord into the kingdom of ends. A kingdom is a systematic unity. So we 
are a systematic unity of rational beings, a kingdom of ends. Okay? A systematic unity of rational beings under common laws. The categorical imperative. Okay? But we are the categorical imperative. So the third formulation really addresses the question of the origin, you know, of the origin of ethics. That I must treat every rational being as a lawgiver, as the ultimate limiting factor on my freedom. My freedom ends where your freedom begins. Okay? All right. But we have one big problem that still is outstanding. Kant has been arguing that the categorical imperative, and as categorical that means universal and necessary, actually exists. And the reason it exists is because of the existence of beings that have absolute worth. The categorical imperative is absolutely binding because it is grounded in the existence of beings themselves which contain an absolute worth. Kant calls it a dignity. And that dignity comes from our autonomy, our freedom. So the categorical imperative exists because freedom exists. <clears throat> but how do I know that freedom actually exists? This raises the perennial problem in philosophy between the idea of freedom and the idea of determinism. We know that every event has a cause. So how is it that I can say that my actions are free rather than being caused by previous events? Okay? How can I possibly prove that I am actually free such that I can subsequently prove the real existence of the categorical imperative? That is our question for Monday. Okay? All right.